My name is Sarah Longman. Um, I'm the uh, Indigenous, I'm the Supervisor for Indigenous Education for Regina Public School Division. My program is, is not a standalone program, it's a program within an organization. Uh, so my, uh, I guess, work that I oversee is uh, the Indigenous education components within the school division. So I oversee, I guess, the academic uh, standing of all of the um, self-declared uh, Indigenous students in Regina Public School. Um, so right now we're, we have about uh, 4,300, four, between 4,300 and 4,400 self-declared students. Um, when we look at those numbers, we break down that self-declared pool of students. 73% um, of those uh, students are uh, treaty status, and then the rest are uh, non-treaty status. A smaller portion is our Métis students, and then just a tiny little speck. I think we have 10 who are our Inuit students. So we have them, uh, when they come into our school division, we have them self-declare, um, let us know who they are. And uh, it helps to uh, focus our programming dollars. It helps to make decisions in terms of our strategic plan and, and how we do our budget allocations for the students. Um, it helps for us to make hard decisions around delivery of different programs. Um, for example, because of our demographics and, and who we are and where we are in the province of Saskatchewan, a large number of our students are uh, Cree, from Cree background. So one of the pieces they share with us, and it's a volunteer, uh, they share with us their status numbers. So from the status numbers, you can pretty well uh, find out the location of the band. So most of those um, a treaty status students are from Cree background. Therefore, we, when we offer our language programs, our Indigenous language programs, we focus on, on Cree um, because that's who our students are. Um, so I, I oversee uh, the students. I, I look at their attendance and monitor um, all of the students on a regular basis uh, to see how they're doing and try to make sure that our students are doing well. They're, they're being uh, successful and they're not falling through the cracks. Um, oftentimes we do have um, uh, students who need, students in the family that need um, extra support. And this is just by, like I said, following our database and taking a look at um, our students in high school, how many of our self-declared students are acquiring um, the credits that they need for that semester. Um, and are they going to be on track to graduate? So um, we follow them again through the data to see how well they're doing academically, um, especially in high school. And what we can do from that is, if I see a student who is um, falling behind in the credits that they've earned at the high school level, um, I can um, um, tap one of our, our uh, Indigenous advocate teachers who are trained uh, teachers that work with Regina Public and they are of an Indigenous background themselves. So if I'm looking and I'm going through the data and I'm, I'm looking at credit attainment, and I see, um, you know, within one, one school, high school, a number of self-declared students who are not on track to graduate, they're losing credits. Um, I, you know, call the advocate teacher and then they pull those students in and they take a look and they review, okay, which assignments were missed? which assignments can we recover. It's, it's, it's called a credit recovery. And uh, what do we need to do to try to get the student back on track to make sure that the student actually graduates on time. So one of the programs I guess I oversee um, is the um, Indigenous Advocate Teachers Program. Uh, the Indigenous Advocate Teachers, I'm really happy to say that they are in nine out of 10 of our high schools. Um, and we kind of take a look at all of that data and where our students are, where our biggest student population is, and, and you know, where they're experiencing um, um, credits that are not being completed. And we put uh, an Indigenous advocate teacher in that high school. And then their jobs is to take all of those kids who are self-declared within that building and to track their, their progress of all of those kids. They do that by connecting um, with the families well and trying to engage the families, um, doing, you know, going to the home and talking to the parents and, 
and you know explaining um, the importance of attendance but also looking at what are some of the barriers that might be in the way preventing uh, students from attending so it could be transportation sometimes uh, it could be issues that they're having with their peers it could be uh, financial um, hardships um, it could be you know personal health reasons I mean there's a number of reasons uh, so the um, advocate teacher works with that family and the student to try to make sure that they, um, you know, the student stays on track and, and actually can graduate. So we have, um, we started a four um, Aboriginal advocate program in our elementary schools as well. So again, we took the elementary schools and we looked at uh, where our highest needs are. So it's a needs-based uh, type of allocation of an advocate teacher. And we have four elementary schools in our school division that have a high number of, of Indigenous students. So that's where we uh, position um, an advocate teacher in the elementary. So they do, they do a lot of work um, connecting with students. Um, a lot of times the students uh, may not feel comfortable talking to the teacher about a mark that they received. Um, and they will you know, go to the advocate teacher and say, can you come with me? Um, or can you go and talk to the teacher about this grade? And, you know, can you talk to them about letting me redo this? Or, you know, there's all sorts of different things, but they play a, a huge role in the lives of the um, Indigenous students. So that's kind of one of the programs that I, I get to oversee and, and watch and, and develop. Another program would be our um, Elders in Residence program. So to support um, our Indigenous students in the building, first and foremost. Um, we have our Elders in Residence program. Uh, they, you know, provide uh, cultural understanding, cultural connections, um, affirming culture. Um, they're just all around positive role models for our students. They are, um, you know, the best huggers, and sometimes our kids just need a hug, and uh, they're, they're so good at that. Um, they're also there to assist and bring their expertise and their knowledge into the classroom, the learning space. Um, so we have predominantly non-Indigenous teaching staff, a large number, and um, they don't have the same level of understanding and knowledge as our, our elders do around our culture and around our, our, our values, our protocols, our knowledge, all of those different pieces. So the teachers will call on um, Indigenous um, um, elders to come in and, and you know do things like, like share a story of a uh, residential school. Um, can you come in and talk about you know the the constellations from an indigenous worldview uh, to complement the, the work that we've been doing on looking at the constellations. Um, things around treaty. Uh, what is what does treaty mean? Um, you know, with the new treaty training curriculum that came out from the ministry. Um, our elders are huge in helping uh, provide a support for that. Um, they also, uh, our elders also connect with our families. So every now and then, um, our Aboriginal advocate teachers, if they're going up to home, and, you know, they kind of sense that perhaps the family would like to have an elder uh, to come in and do a prayer. Maybe they want an elder to come in and do, do a bunch of new house. Um, or, or something, um, our Aboriginal advocate teacher will team up with an elder and the two of them will go and, and visit the family and have conversations and see how they could help support um, whatever that family may be requesting. Uh, we have, um, you know, oftentimes a lot of our urban families um, don't, are, are not as closely connected to a lot of our culture and a lot of it is urbanization and colonization and the impact of residential schools and all of those pieces. So our elders play a huge role in helping our kids to reconnect. We have a lot of um, Indigenous students who um, are in foster care or have been adopted um, into non-Indigenous homes. Um, and they're trying to find out who they are. They're trying to find their identity. They're trying to get their connections in place to their community. Um, there's all of those um, different pieces. And of course, our elders, um, you know, as soon as they hear an Indigenous last name, they can almost, you know, pretty accurately tell them where their family's from based on their name. Um, so they do, they do all of those things, but they're they're very skilled at developing relationships. So 
You know, we see a lot of uh, different institutions and a lot of organizations working with bringing in cultural awareness training for their staff. We see that in so many different sectors and so many different humongous organizations. And, you know, we found um, it, our experience has been, it's been our elders um, and the relationships that they've been able to build um, with our non-Indigenous colleagues that have been, have had such a huge, profound effect on um, opening, opening the mind to different ways of knowing, um, creating an openness about, you know, thinking about other worldviews, um, thinking about how to incorporate this other worldview into a very westernized um, curriculum. Um, and just, just, just becoming friends, you know, just making that person to person, that human contact has been so important. And our elders are so good at doing that. Um, again, when we are working with our elders and residents, we try to, we try our hardest to ensure that our, our, our people that are working within our elders program are very much near who our community is. So in our community here, we have uh, our, our Lakota, uh, Dakota, Nakota people, we have our Cree, and then we have our, our um, Anishinaabe people and our Métis people. Um, within that group, within those language groups, we also have some people who are very, very closely connected to their culture. And we have others who have been disconnected for lots of reasons. So those same dynamics that we have within our population, we try to get our elders um, to reflect that. So we have some very traditional elders who've been able to maintain and keep their language, and also elders who've been able to, um, you know, still keep some of our traditional ways of knowing alive and well. Um, we also have some of our elders who are, this is probably a really bad term, but I, I call them contemporary elders. So they don't have, um, for, for lots of reasons, they've, they've lost the connection to speaking their language. They don't have their language. Um, and they, you know, their sense of understanding our culture is very much a contemporary way of looking at it. Our elders all serve a really, really important role to our community. Our, our family members who have been disconnected from their culture tend to tend to gravitate more to our elders who are more contemporary rather than our elders who are very traditional. So our contemporary elders really open the door, I think, um, for a lot of further questions, for a lot of further learning and understanding that happens. Um, so they all play a really critical role, a crucial role to our students, um, to their families, the students' families, as well as to our educators um, that work with us. So they're all kind of working towards a better understanding of our culture and our knowledge and appreciation of, of our traditional ways of knowing and, and, bringing, and, and bringing that into um, this Western curriculum and fusing the two worlds together. Uh, so it makes sense for um, the learners as well. I also get an opportunity to work with um, our Elders Advisory Council, um, which is another one of our programs. And our Elders Advisory Council is a little bit different. Uh, they don't work so much one-on-one -on -one in the school like the Elders and Residents do. Our Elders um, Advisory Council um, sit side by side with our board of trustees. So if we're looking our, our, at our organizational structure within a school division, our trustees are, are um, elected officials that actually run an election um, on a, on a four-year cycle, and they get voted in by the community to be a trustee. Those trustees then, um, you know, are kind of at the top of the organizational uh, structure, followed by our director of education and all the other folks that kind of fall underneath, um, underneath him. And so, so they play a, a critical role in, um, you know, our strategic planning. Um, the elders that sit side by side with the trustees, again, you know, very much like our elders and residents, they offer um, their cultural understanding. They offer um, their cultural knowledge and they guide our trustees in making uh, decisions that impact the Indigenous students, the Indigenous community. Um, you know, things like um, we, we recently um, developed and, and implemented a smudging policy. So of course, when you're working with bringing in something like smudging into a very public institution, there's all sorts of different um, 
policies that will collide. So for example, we have our occupational health policy and that directly collides with um, our smudging policy. We have our no smoking policy that directly collides with our smudging policy. So for our um, trustees and our elders to work together to kind of navigate a space um, for how that policy could develop, be developed and how it could be implemented at a grassroots level, the, the, the trustees will, will rely heavily on the expertise of the elders um, on what that would look like. So uh, they do a lot of that um, with, our, with our trustees. So, so forming policy and, and of course policy always informs practice as well. So we have that group as well. Um, we do a lot of, um, in terms of our, our teachers and our school administrators, we do a lot of work on uh, helping to, to close the knowledge gap of non-Indigenous educators and administrators. Uh, many of our uh, folks that we work with um, have a solid grasp of curriculum and, and instructional pedagogy and all of those technical pieces that come along with um, having a teaching certificate. Um, but a lot of them will um, have grown up in a very Western education system, an education system that has not included um, Indigenous history. Um, things like, uh, you know, they don't understand um, residential schools. I mean, it's getting better. You know, our new teachers that are coming into the systems now understand and know our history about residential schools. They understand what day schools are all about. Um, they can make the connection between some of those um, federal imposed um, schooling systems and the connection to some of the contemporary things around murdered missing indigenous women for example they can make those connections but not all of our educators can do that we still have a lot of gaps uh, people who've gone through entire systems of education who are very highly educated that have never had an opportunity to learn about our history around the residential schools here in canada it's only been really really recent last decade that people have been exposed to that information. So we still have large knowledge gaps of, of people who don't have that understanding. So a lot of the work that I do um, is I try to provide as much as that, of that uh, background uh, for the staff as possible um, so they can re-engage um, in a culturally um, proficient way with our families, um, with, our, with our students, and of course with our elders in our community. Uh, so, you know, what are what are the long-term um, residual effects of the residential school and how does that play out in our classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis? So we talk about trauma and, you know, how trauma uh, plays out in, in many of our students who have been exposed to violence in the home, who have been exposed to, um, you know, some of the chronic issues that have come through intergenerational trauma. And how do you build a safe learning environment for those students so that uh, they're not triggered time after time after time? So, for example, a small example is, you know, many of our uh, children who've grown up in, in with violence around violence will, will react uh, to, to certain loud sounds. And oftentimes those loud sounds, you know, is uh, could be one of their triggers. And when someone who's experiencing trauma, unresolved trauma, they will react and respond to that trauma, to that stimuli in the environment, not knowing exactly what they're responding to. So a lot of the work that we do is, is trauma-informed practice, um, teaching our educators and our staff uh, what trauma-informed practice looks like. Um, we do culturally, uh, culturally affirmative, I guess, uh, resources bringing in um, contemporary representation of who we are. So we try to do away with all of the stereotypes that are inside books and, and teaching um, educators about the impact that has on some of our young people, especially our young kids who are just starting to read and they can't make sense of the context. Uh, they rely on the pictures. And if the picture is filled with a negative cultural stereotype, um, you know, the kids will buy into that. So I guess part of the other, the other important piece of work that we do is, is, you know, Indigenous education is not only important for Indigenous kids, but it's just as important for non-Indigenous students as well. They need to understand um, that they themselves have probably some stereotypes that they need to work on. 
um, they need to have those stereotypes replaced with accurate information. Um, otherwise, there's a whole bunch of assumptions being made about a culture that's totally inaccurate. Uh, some of those uh, stereotypes left um, unaddressed will turn into something really big and ugly, and it turns into, before you know it, that's racism. It's the seeds of racism. And uh, so a lot of the work that, that I do with, with educators is, you know, helping them to um, bring in good content, good, good accurate um, information, good literature from our own Indigenous writers, um, um, accurate representation of who we are as Indigenous people to help break down a lot of those stereotypes. Um, I also do um, a lot of work with trying to um, bring about a solid Cree language program, which is really, really tough to do. Um, trying to align resources, uh, trying to um, you know, clean up the stuff around the interchangeable use of different dialects, for example. So a lot of our non-Indigenous um, educators wouldn't be aware of, you know, the difference between the TH dialect in Cree and N dialect in Cree. But kids who are learning this language uh, can definitely differentiate between the two dialects at the same time. So again, you know, working with the educators to, to understand um, those pieces of language is huge. So a lot of the work, you know, as well as managing the students and managing some of these programs have to do with, you know, always thinking of what are some skills that I need to bring uh, to our non-Indigenous educators so they can do the absolutely best job of engaging, um, teaching, and building pride for Indigenous learners and their families. So that's huge, that's a lot of work. I've been in this job for six and a half years now. Um, it's a fairly new uh, position that was created within our school division um, to kind of have some kind of oversee um, all of the programs um, that we have in place. However, uh, there have been people that have been doing this work long before me. Um, so we've had, we have, uh, you know, cultural or cultural liaison uh, person who's been uh, there for a number of years as well. And his job is to um, connect with our community and to find the people in our community that are really talented at doing things. So, you know, he's pretty connected to the community. So if someone is looking at, can we have someone come into our fine arts classroom and, and bring in quilling? Um, he'd find a person in the community that knows how to do quill work and we'll bring them into the classroom and connect them um, in the learning environment with the educators as well. Um, so he's been he's been doing that work for, for a long time. So I think within our school division, I'm going to say safely, um, we've been kind of doing this work and it's been built on every time something new kind of comes in. I think it's probably safe to say it's been 20 years that has been happening. So it's fairly, fairly young, I guess, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I look at the uh, number of, first of all, our self-declared students. Uh, so when I first started uh, doing the self-declared work and trying to measure the exact number that we had in our school division, our numbers were actually quite low. It was 2,700 um, six years ago. And, and today we're at 4,400. So it's not like we've had a whole influx of of Indigenous families moved to the city in the last six years. I think we've done a better job of promoting culture in a very positive way. So now our numbers went from 2,700 six years ago to around 4,400 now. So there, that's a significant increase in, in students and families who self-declare. Um, the other piece that I look at is our graduation rates for our First Nations meeting with students. Um, that number has increased. Um, I mean, it's nowhere near where we need to be, but it's a heck of a lot better than where we were uh, when we initially started. Um, so we are, you know, we're around 57% uh, grad rate. Uh, we used to be around 27. So we've improved by about 30%, and I know that we could do better um, in how we do this work. So, um, you know, how is the gap closing? I mean, it's a tough gap to, to measure. Um, I think the other gap is just, the um, number of, of non-Indigenous educators now who are um, incorporating on a regular basis um, Indigenous ways of knowing Indigenous knowledge. And that's a, tougher get, that's a tougher number to try to measure, but certainly, um, you know, if we look at things like, um, you know, smudging, 
in schools. And you know, when we first roll this thing out, people were really apprehensive and kind of not sure on how they should do it. And of course, there's this being predominantly non-Indigenous people doing this. And now we've got schools that sponge on a regular basis. We have entire schools that sponge um, on a regular basis. We have, um, you know, we have on the uh, 28th of March, we have our, our annual Feast and Round Dance coming up um, for Regina Public School and something we started four years ago. So this will be our fourth one. And it's hosted by um, a different high school. So when we talked to our Elders Advisory Council about how we could do this, they suggested to us that we uh, do, you know, each high school kind of be the host and we go in kind of this clockwise um, direction in, in selecting the host. So this year we're kind of at the north now. And um, so our northern school, high school, is going to host this Feast and Round Dance. And it's... Um, also in partnership with all of the elementary feeder schools around that high school. So it's um, being put together by predominantly non-Indigenous staff. And I mean, that's a huge task. Um, of course, they're being guided by, you know, we, we provide direction, guidance, and our cultural liaison, you know, puts the important pieces in place. But a lot of the planning, a lot of the the preparing of the food is done by our female elders. So our female elders will go into the school and work with the staff, the female staff, on how to cook the food. Um, prior to that, we had a, a you know a couple of months ago, we had a, a ribbon skirt making night where we had one of our our community ladies that knows about ribbon skirts come in and do an explanation about it. And anybody who was wishing to make their skirt at that time, she would take them through that. So there's been a lot of work and. You know, just to see, I guess, the level of, of how receptive people are now and in incorporating uh, what we do and how we th do things into a very uh, Western structure is, is astonishing to see. I mean, honestly, I just never, ever believed that we would be at this point. Um, and, you know, just it just goes to the work of, you know, the Indigenous um, advocate teachers, the... Um, elders that we have in place, um, you know, our trustees and our elders advisory and putting together the, all of the pieces come together so we could see something like a Feast and Round Dance being held in one of our uh, predominantly, you know, um, white middle class schools and neighborhoods. So I don't know how we would measure that in terms of numbers. Uh, you know, the openness is just, I, I just know that, you know, we have grown leaps and bounds from where we were um, you know, seven, eight years ago to where we are today. I thought I used to know, <laughs> but then I've kind of changed my my um, understanding as I went as I went along and and became a part of it. I, I don't know if we've really figured that out yet um, because it's so big. Um, you know, I think it encompasses a few pieces. Um, I think it's 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 certainly our, our traditional ways of knowing. Um, it incorporates our worldview. Um, it incorporates our language. It incorporates our relationships. Uh, our relationship with the land. Our relationship to our identity. Our our kinship relationships. Um, all of those pieces are a part of it. And coming together and knowing who we are as Indigenous people. Um, knowing the difference between being you know an Indian woman um, and being a Anishinaabe, very, very different. And I think that journey in between those two uh, pieces of uh, definitions, I guess, is, is kind of what Indigenous education means to me. Um, you know, and then talking to our elders again and thinking about what they say, you know, they talk to us. And you know, I've heard so many times, and it's kind of cliche now, but, you know, education is our, our new buffalo, is the other thing I've heard as well. And, you know, if you think of, of a system and a structure in place, and it's something that we need to sustain us, to sustain, to sustain who we are as Indigenous people, to sustain our communities, our well-being, um, you know, our future, our young people. Um, education is, is where we need to go. It's what does that education look like is, is kind of a, a huge question for me um, because I see the, 
the best of both worlds for our students, you know, understanding our culture and our language, at the same time knowing how to utilize technology um, and using that technology to, to promote who we are, but also to share our voice in a very powerful way to unify, you know, the the tribes of Indigenous people around the world, like around the world, uh, so that we, you know, all become a unified force when we're looking at things like, uh, you know, the, the, the pipelines and the deforestation and, you know, the, the murder of missing Indigenous women. I mean, technology is huge in bringing those issues to, to light and bringing people together. So I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, it's a little bit of, you know, taking the best of, of the Western world, um, and finding a way to utilize that to promote and sustain who we are as Indigenous people, at the same time reconnecting um, with our culture and our language at a very deep level, um, and using those values to, to move us forward um, while bringing the next generation behind us. So laying a strong foundation for the little ones that are coming behind us. I have huge dreams. <laughs> I want I want to see um, you know I want to see indigenous directors of education in the public systems. I want to see you know our schools reflect and have a high number of um, indigenous educators, so that our kids have those role models that they they can look up to. Um, so they have teachers who have a similar lived experience, yet um, can demonstrate to them what resiliency looks like. Um, we need to have those people within our institutions. Um, we need to have our non-Indigenous people um, clear a space for Indigenous people to um, be the ones at the front. Uh, we need our Indigenous or non-Indigenous allies to kind of step back and, and allow Indigenous people now to, to take the reins and take the lead. Um, I think all of the answers that we need lie within our, our communities. Um, and I'm going to be very biased, but it, it, it's, it's about our women. And, uh, you know, I really see Indigenous women taking a strong stance and shifting and, and changing things uh, for our kids, for our communities. In the next uh, 10 years, I'd love to see, um, you know, the graduation gap closed. Um, I'd love to see, you know, um, our students not only, you know, graduating and, and with a grade 12 and, and finding, you know, a job. I want to see, you know, our Indigenous kids coming out with an engineer degree. I want to see them as doctors. I want to see you know, our Indigenous kids walking through the hallways of, of Harvard University because they have every single right to be there. Um, I want to see our Indigenous lawyers, you know, our Indigenous pharmacy, pharma, pharmacists, um, and I really love to see them, you know, walking hand in hand uh, with their language intact and their identity of who they are. Um, and these are going to be our folks that are going to kind of lead the way. So that's my dream for the next 10 years.